Okay, so uh, I think the, uh, my, my pleasure to introduce my uh, colleague, um, Professor Andrew Martin, uh, who is Professor of Educational Psychology in the School of Education at the University of New South Wales in Australia. He specializes in motivation, engagement, achievement, and quantitative research methods. He's also honorary research fellow at the Department of Education at the University of Oxford, hence our uh, collaboration. He's honorary professor in the Faculty of Education and Social Work at the University of Sydney. He's fellow of the American <coughs> Education Research Association and president of the International Association of Applied Psychologies, Division 5, Educational, Instructional and School Psychology. And today he will talk about his um, experience sampling study on motivation and engagement during a month at school. A month at school. Every minute of every day for every student matters. Again. So Andrew, it's all yours. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much, uh, folks. And uh, I just want to make sure I'm standing in the right spot for those that do want to see me over the... Uh, the webinar yeah. is the right spot. Okay, welcome to anyone who's uh, who's viewing now, and uh, welcome to all those viewers in the future who are viewing uh, this and the other presentations. Um, I was just uh, I, I got into the UK, but just a bit over 24 hours ago, and uh, and I was priding myself actually yesterday on how good I was feeling. I'd beaten this jet lag thing, and uh, <laughs> I was just sitting there in the previous sessions. Uh, uh, thankfully, they were most engaging because if they weren't, I think I would have just slipped into a uh, a, uh, a very uh, a very deep uh, slumber. So if I'm looking a little bit dopey, there's a good reason for it. Um, there's two parts to this uh, to this presentation. Uh, the first is um, a little bit of a, a refresher on some work that we'd done and uh, and have published on. And I'll present the. Uh, I'll give you the reference for that, and uh, and so that was our first uh, our first foray into um, collecting, I guess, real time data or intra uh, individual data in in the moment, and uh, and so I'll I'll uh, just run through that that research study and and some of its findings uh, first, and then. Um, uh, there are a number of research gaps that uh, that was that were sitting there after that study, and so I'll then move into a second study that um, that uh, that sought to address uh, those uh, those research gaps. And so the two are sort of, a, and we're just just uh, finishing uh, writing up that. And uh, in fact, we we have written it up, and uh, and I'll I'll use this as a as a public shaming exercise. We're just waiting on Lars to, uh, to provide his input on that. <laughs> so, uh, so there we go. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, so as soon as we do that and get Lars's wisdom, which we do need and rely on, he's, I think he's scratching his head thinking, did I receive something? Um, he's looking very blank. <laughs> so anyway, maybe we have to send it to him first. I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, so we'll, um, uh, we're, we're, we're um, just finalising that study now, so it's a nice <clears throat> opportunity to share that with you guys, and also uh, any questions and comments, we'd, uh, we're in a good position to um, to receive those. Um, so, as Lars indicated, uh, our research program, one of its main channels is, is student motivation and student engagement. And, uh, you know, as I guess many of us have done, and most of us have done, have spent a lot of time in, in cross-sectional uh, territory. And if we do do longitudinal research, it's been typically pre and post, or maybe you know, three or four time points to do a little bit of growth modelling and so on. Uh, but from a motivation engagement perspective, we're interested in, uh, I guess, looking at um, how motivation engagement uh, travel over over the course of uh, a more intensive uh, course of the day uh, and the weekend and, and, uh, and beyond. And so uh, we were interested in answering some of these questions using this intra-individual real-time data collection uh, uh, technologies and opportunities. And so we were asking how much does motivation 
play out over the course of a day uh, and a week and a month at school? Um, is there more or less uh, variation in motivation engagement uh, within a day, for example, between lessons than between days and weeks? Uh, another question is uh, when we look at students' uh, real-time motivation, uh, how much of that is influenced by um, you know, pre-existing motivation, the motivation they walk into the classroom with, for example. So in time series or intensive longitudinal data, we might look at the previous moment, uh, but what about broader levels of motivation and how they shape uh, individuals' real-time experience? And I guess uh, uh, we've been exploring various, uh, various methods and technologies to collect and capture this, these data, and so, uh, so it's also in some ways technological research question as well as to how useful that can be. Uh, and so as I, uh, so as I indicated, uh, most longitudinal motivation engagement research is conducted over two time periods, and so the beginning and end of a, of a year or a term. And so this has allowed us to test for change or stability. Uh, it enables us to partial out uh, prior variants, and so we can assess for example, gains over that period of time, once we get the residual, we'll address the, 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 the time two measure on the time one measure. And in particular research designs, this also can get, help us to get at um, various aspects of causal ordering. And so that research design, time one, time two, or time one, time two, time three, is, is very helpful and very effective at, at answering um, uh, many research questions. Um, some research, uh, even le less research though, um, collects data over three, four, or sometimes five or so uh, testing sessions, and so that allows us to uh, um, model trajectories over time, uh, allows us to look at development over time, and so these two have been very effective and important at answering uh, research questions in our in our field or in my field being educational psychology um, but relatively few studies will collect longitudinal data beyond those uh, those parameters and so uh, and so that's led to uh, uh, an interest in more intensive uh, longitudinal data capturing and uh, and so days such as uh, such as today and so, so the, um, the research program thus far, and, uh, and on, on another channel actually, I've been collaborating with Lars and he shared a couple of those studies um, in his session. Uh, but the research program that's been happening in, in Australia is, uh, there's two studies as I suggested I'd share with you. Um, they're real-time intensive longitudinal data, and we're using mobile technology, uh, iPads, tablets, iPhones, smartphones, and so on. And we will, uh, we will uh, ask students to rate their motivation and engagement up to three times a day uh, on each school day and for a period of four weeks at school. And so across these two studies, we collected data on students' motivation and engagement, <clears throat> and we also um, have captured uh, data on non-academic measures such as uh, self-esteem, sense of purpose, adaptability, and so on. The approach that we've used, and, it, and, it's, and I guess this is the other thing, is with intensive longitudinal data, um, you've got a lot of options as to how to model uh, uh, that data and so it was interesting uh, seeing for example the approaches that Lars was was sharing and before him Barbara and so uh, what we've done is also harnessed a multi-level uh, approach but uh, but we've done so in a slightly different way to Lars and, and I'll share that with you and so using multi-level modeling we can uh, we can model variability, um, 
within the, within the day, uh, between days, between weeks and between students. We can also, uh, once we capture uh, fixed data points through the day and through the week and so on, we're also able to test the rise and fall uh, on these various measures, um, these measures here, through a day, through a week and so on. Uh, we can control for potentially influential factors such as sociodemographics, prior achievement. Um, in study two, we can also uh, control for prior motivation that kids are walking into the classroom with, for example, and then uh, adjust for that when looking at real-time motivation. And so there are a lot of opportunities, um, analytical opportunities, once you design a study in a particular way. And so uh, what um, the yields of this, uh, of these particular two studies was um, to our knowledge structured in this way is, is one of the first to collect uh, data within the day, between days, between weeks and between students on these motivation engagement factors. And, um, and also uh, one of the first to collect real time uh, motivation data in this way and so um, this allows insights into motivation engagement theorising, for example, around stability and developmental issues. Um, it also uh, provides guidance for technological applications to do this sort of thing and logistic guidance for real-time data collection. And also um, some analytical directions for how to handle these sorts of, uh, sorts of data. So, as I indicated, this is, the, this is the, the research design, if you like. So we have, at level one, we collect data within the day. And so I said up to three times a day, we would ask students to rate on these various measures. We'd ask students to do that each day um, for a period of four weeks, and we asked a certain number of students to do this. And so we have a four level model. We have ratings within the day, nested within a day. We have a day or days of the week nest, nested within the week, and we have weeks nested under students. And so designing the study in this way allows us to see how much variability there is within a day, between days, between weeks, and between students on each of these outcome measures. We can also, as I suggested, build in some fixed effects into these models. And so, for example, if we were looking at effects within the day, we can maybe a linear relationship, and so from morning until evening, motivation goes up or down. Or we may find, because we have three time points and an inflection point, we may see that you know there might be, you know, might uh, escalate through the day and then then drop off. So, for example, there is some <coughs> some um, schools in uh, in Australia in Sydney um, where they're they're struggling schools. They're in very disadvantaged areas, and they're looking to restructure the day. Um, given the particular students they have. And so most, of, you know, looking at their data, most of their, ex their suspensions and expulsions happen after lunch. And so they're looking to stack up the front end of the day with class and the back end of the day with sport and all, that, all the sort of stuff that the, uh, the kids enjoy. And so, uh, and so I guess in some way they're, um, you know, they're not, they haven't said, oh, we've found there's a curvy linear relationship in this and that, but that's essentially what they're talking about. Um, or within the week, um, uh, for example, um, you know, does motivation go um, straight up like an arrow through the week or straight down or, you know, um, as they, uh, um, I'm getting a bit tired of this term every time I put on a radio in Sydney at the moment on a Wednesday, they call it hump day. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, that's the day we've just got to get past before we start sliding to the weekend and life gets better again. 
Anyway, so it does, is the is the hump day for uh, for school students during the, their academic term or within the month? How does uh, how does the relationship, the pattern of motivation play out? As I suggested um, in our studies, we try and control for factors that um, that are known to um, share variance with uh, with the variance outcome measures, and so age, ethnicity. Uh, socio-demographics, prior motivation engagement, and also prior achievement. So, just uh, sharing with you the findings of study one, as a bit of a refresher, but as a segue to study two, which is where we're at. So we had 20 students in this one, and again, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, as a new area, I'm, most of my research usually um, has a couple of extra zeros on this sort of sample size. And so um, in, our, in our world, in the mainstream uh, journals, they struggle with the point you've got to get across is in fact the, the sampling is at the, is at the unit of measurement, not so much at the person level. Once you're into intra-individual territory, and so it, it um, we were sort of knocked around a bit by, um, by uh, you know, by reviewers and so on, and, and fair enough. Uh, but so it took a particular writing um, uh, and an explanation and rationale to argue for, for 20 students, and in fact, where the, the real unit of, of, uh, of sampling was. And so, um, and so, three times a day, five days a week four consecutive weeks. We had two thirds of 60 possible responses. So um, there are 60 possible responses per student. We had about 38 per student for each outcome. And so we sampled students in year seven and 11. Um, those two were selected for broader research program reasons. Year seven's the start of high school. In Australia, year 11's the, the start of senior high school. In Australia. It was in one school and there are various aspects of this sample that, um, that presented uh, that not, weren't limitations but were, were, but were particular and so hence our study too that redressed a number of these. Uh, and so um, they're all boys and uh, the um, from a higher um, higher achieving school and this school also comprised a, uh, a smaller cohort of boarding students and so there are a couple of students from the boarding cohort. Um, we actually included that as a covariate to partially out that effect. Um, we used SurveyMonkey as the, um, the, uh, the real-time data capturing software and so students just jumped onto URL and answered various questions. Uh, and so each student were, was asked to race, rate themselves up to three times a day. The study was conducted in term one. Students were sent reminders if their response rates were starting to get a bit patchy. They were asked to rate themselves before lunch, before the last lesson and in the evening. The order of items was randomised at the start of each week. We administered the short form of the motivation engagement scale. So there's 11 factors in the MES. There's an adaptive behavior fa factor, an adaptive cognition uh, cluster of factors, maladaptive cognition and maladaptive behavior. Uh, and the short form represents one item for each of the 11 factors. Students rate themselves on a one to seven scale. And so here are the sample items. Uh, for, uh, for each of these uh, 11 factors in the MES. And so adaptive cognition comprised um, self-efficacy, valuing school, mastery orientation, adaptive behaviour comprised persistence, task management and planning. Maladaptive cognition comprised anxiety, failure avoidance and uncertain control, and maladaptive behaviours comprised disengagement and self-handicapping. Um, 
the materials for non-academic outcomes, uh, a single item from each of these major scales, sense of meaning, satisfaction of life, self-esteem and adaptability. And um, the covariance, sociodemographics and prior achievement. And so, as I indicated, data were conceptualised as a four-level model. Level one, within the day through to level four, between students. And so, two steps in the data analysis. The first was a variance components analysis, where we looked at how much variation in each of these measures at levels one through to four. And in step two, uh, the same model, but we include the fixed uh, linear effects and non-linear effects of within the day, within week and within the month and we also included the sociodemographics and prior achievement as fixed effects. So this is all a bit um, uh, overwhelming and so, so to crudely uh, cut to the chase so this is the variance components analysis and so here you can see the amount of variance on each of these measures, or on average in absolute terms, uh, within the day, between days, between weeks, and between students. And so the bulk of variance you can see there, in the main, is within the day. And so uh, across the three points of the day, there's uh, one part of the bulk of variance explained. And after accounting for that, the next cap off the rank uh, is, uh, is between students. So once we account for variation between students and within day variance, the bulk of variance is captured. There wasn't so much between days and there wasn't so much between weeks. When we look at um, the non-academic measures, we can see similar pattern, but less intraday variability and more between person variability. And so in the paper, we position these non-academic measures <coughs> in terms of uh, more trait-like and should be, or or in the context of one's um, academic day, more trait-like. And so it was hypothesised that because the academic measures were being collected in more of an academic context, we might pick up more variability within the day and little less between students relative to the non-academic measures and in fact that turned out to be the case. When we um, included the covariates and when we included um, the linear and non-linear effects of time, the same sort of results were found. Most of the variation within the day and between students for motivation engagement and again the same for um, the non-academic or personal wellbeing measures. So looking at looking at the question of within the day fixed effects and non-linear uh, linear and non-linear effects. Um, we found for the most part there was not really a, uh, a linear or a non-linear pattern. It was quite varied. There was no uh, there was no pattern attributable to time and the same for the non-academic measures. So, that's study one. <coughs> but coming off study one, there are a number, of, a number of gaps, a number of questions. And so, 
one of the gaps was study one was with boys and so study two boys and girls another one was study one was conducted in one school so we collected data across two schools and we collected these data in maths and English lessons and so whereas study one just you know rate yourself sometime before lunch sometime before the end of the day and sometime at night we actually anchored um, the uh, the real-time ratings in two subjects each day. And so again, using mobile electronic devices, so whereas up to, if previously it was up to three times a day, because it was English and maths, it was up to two times a day. Same research design, except this time we also included, uh, we included prior motivation and engagement to also control for motivation that might be walking in the door to partial that out from real-time variability. Another limitation of the previous study one was a small sample size, um, and so we collected data for more students this time. And so similar procedure, survey monkey, rate yourself on the spot where you are. <coughs> Again, randomising item order. Whereas um, in the previous study, we asked, we administered the domain general form of the motivation engagement scale, so your academic motivation at that point in time, academic motivation, because we didn't know what subject they were going to be in when they rated themselves in study one. In study two, we did know what subject they were going to be in. And so we were able to administer the math version and the English version of the MES. They're parallel items, just some, just referring to the word maths or English. We use the short form again, so one item per factor. The long form is four items per, per, for each of the 11 factors. And so, same factors, adaptive cognition, self-efficacy, valuing, mastery, Adaptive behaviour, persistence, task management and planning. Maladaptive cognition, anxiety, failure avoidance, uncertain control, and maladaptive behaviours, disengagement and self-handicapping. Again, so the de demographics included as covariates. How am I going for time? Nice, thanks. Um, prior achievement and also notably for this study, prior motivation, which was a pretest using the long form of the MES, so their academic motivation generally administered in the prior week. Same data analytic setup, levels one through four, within the day through to between students. Again, step one, variance components analysis, and step two, that, but with certain demographics, prior treatment, prior motivation engagement, is fixed effects. So here are the adaptive motivation and engagement factors. And so, same pattern. You can see the bulk of variance between students and within the day. Not so much variability from day to day, not so much variability from week to week. When we look at maladaptive motivation engagement, again, same. Between students and within the day where the bulk of variance is accounted for. When we include fixed effects, You can see that um, age and gender, and to a lesser extent, prior achievement, explains motivation engagement in real time. But you can also see that prior motivation, the, mo the motivation levels a week before also accounts for their real time, uh, their motivation in real time. And so the design was helpful in partialing that out to further consider the real-time effects. For maladaptive motivation engagement, 
gender, ethnicity, prior achievement and prior motivation account for also explain real time motivation and engagement. So when we include those fixed effects and prior motivation and so on, and we return back to how much variability is there between students and within the day, we find similar pattern in the sense that there's a bulk of variance at, between students and the bulk of variance within the day is where the action is. But you can see that it's, these are significantly reduced, particularly between students, once, once we include particularly prior levels of motivation and engagement. And so this study was important in when we're capturing real-time data, I think it's important to capture um, their motivational orientations prior to that as their set point and then see what's going on within the day. Because these findings suggested that in fact that starts pulling off multi-level variants off the boil a bit, but not to the extent that it would alter conclusions. And, uh, and then the maladaptive, once we've included those sociodemographics, prior treatment, prior motivation, again, we still see the bulk of variants between students and within the day, but again, a lot of the variance, particularly between students, um, has, uh, has been attenuated because of those, uh, those fixed effects. And so you can see the yield of study two over study one. So, time of the day, week or month, um, we found that um, the linear and non-linear effects, rise and fall, rise or fall, um, was, not, was not significant. So it's not the time of the day or the week, but what's actually happening at a particular time that affects academic outcomes. And so it's the nature of activities, particular classroom teacher context, not the timing that's of activities that seems to be uh, the, um, the critical thing. So students can be motivated in the last period um, if they're in, in an engaging lesson and can be unmotivated in the first period if it's an unengaging lesson. They will go up and down depending on what goes on, which is why, hence the title of the paper, every moment of every day matters for every student. Variability between students, and so there is substantial variance between kids. Um, the academic, more so for um, the non-academic measures, perhaps they're a little more trait-like and thus less likely to vary from through the day and through the week and month. Variability within the day accounted for uh, significant variance as well. More so for the academic measures. Again, not surprising, they're, they're more context dependent. And so we do tell teachers that each lesson is a new opportunity to motivate or demotivate a student. And so also we tell teachers that we can't take their motivation engagement set point for granted, even though they, they do come in with a particular level. Um, it's also very dependent on what's happening. So up to 35% within day variance in motivation. And so, and I think I, I, think I saw it in Lars's presentation about you know, labelling kids. Uh, it means that no student is singularly motivated or no student is singularly unmotivated. You know, it will depend on where they're at and what they're doing. Um, the role of prior motivation and so in study two, um, that was a major source of prior variance. It was the strongest predictor of all the fixed effects. And so um, this may be perhaps a qualifying note for real-time researchers. So although real-time data capture present moment, uh, present moment variance, uh, the present moment is strongly influenced by prior moments. Uh, and not just the prior moments, one or two spots in their time series at the time. I mean, the week before, for example, or the set point. Um, and so uh, real-time motivation engagement is thus comprised of variants attribu attributable to the here and now, but also to students' previous experiences. Variability between days and weeks, not so much there, which was interesting. So after accounting for all lessons and activities, each day resembles another, and each week resembles another. Students, I suspect, would would attest to that. Oh, every day's the same. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so um, uh, 
and that's the case. So for example, in study one and two schools, usually in a day there's English, math, science and one or two electives. There'll be maybe a bit of sport, there'll be a bit of pastoral care meeting, there'll be an assembly, and that's the day. And each day seems to sort of fairly look the same. And the data seem to be picking that up. Intervention. So uh, I guess intervention, given there was between student variance and within day variance, intervention should be person oriented, directed, and activity oriented and directed. And so person-centred would target individual students and differentiate where relevant and possible. And activity uh, intervention would, would closely look at the lessons and activities and substance uh, of what's going on. And so in both cases, obviously, pedagogy would be a focus. And so uh, getting those person and activity aspects right, the pedagogy would differentiate instruction to map onto students' needs, that's the student level, but also student activities and subject matter. Limitations? Um, well, uh, for study one, um, it was important to uh, uh, randomise questions each day. So in study one, we actually randomised questions each week, but in study two, I forgot to mention, we randomised questions each day to further reduce response bias. Whole class participation, so one, one other tricky thing, particularly with consent um, issues, because in study one there are a few students selected from each class and they would in the middle of the lesson be doing that and that would be distracting other kids saying what are you doing and all that sort of stuff, so whole class approaches to this are important. Um, and uh, also I'm not sure if Lars would, because I know Lars and others have brought their own devices in, but um, we found it more effective for students just to use the devices they had and they knew to reduce that sort of novelty and so on. And so it was just a URL that they'd jump on whatever device they were at and, uh, and um, use that. Boys were in study one, so we had boys and girls in study two. So, I guess I wanted to show how there are some gaps following from one study and how a second study sought to plug those gaps but also identified some uh, other novel features. And so um, uh, I think also that uh, even though I haven't really focused so much on the technology that uh, it was certainly a, um, it certainly captured some very uh, interesting and useful data uh, across these two um, research investigations. So um, I'm not sure how I'm travelling on time and how much I've got for questions, but I'm happy to take any if I have one. Thank you, Andrew. Take uh, one or two questions, and they will have one line up here. Hi, Andrew. Thank you. I think this is a, a fantastic study. It's really interesting to hear about. Um, I've got a kind of practical, logistical question. Uh, that I'd like to ask you about the sort of viability of using technology in schools. Um, so I was really inspired by one of these earlier seminars to try and uh, use some mobile phones uh, applications to try and collect some data. So everything got set up, everything was set up with Neil Lady who came to all the earlier things, got all the questions sorted. Got as far as the schools who kind of indicated that they'd be interested in participating. Hurdle number one was that this was students weren't allowed to take their mobile phones into school. I was like, okay, is there a potential way around this? Um, you know, it wouldn't be able to capture real-time data, but maybe we could still get them to do it at home in the evening and it still might be able to capture individual differences. And then after a bit of thought, the schools thought it was just too intrusive for <coughs> us to have students' phone numbers, you know, data protection and so on that we'd need, or that Neil needed in order to track responses over time. So it ended up really happening. So I just wondered if you could kind of use your experience, your practical experience of conducting these kind of studies just to unpack how you went about solving these issues or getting around them in a different way. Yeah, so the schools we conducted our research in were what, what is called a, a BYOD, a bring your own device school. Uh, and so, uh, so they can bring any any device they have, a laptop, a, a, a tablet, uh, an iPad, and they and so there was, it wasn't an issue in ours, uh, in 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 our setup. And so I, it, 
it had come down to, I imagine, A, the sort of the, the education district or jurisdiction that's in and how much it, it's supportive and, and so on of technology. Um, and also the, um, and how, how I guess, normalised technology is in the classroom. I guess if you're introducing a novel, something novel, I'm not sure what, what sort of, how much variance attributable to that you can, and disentangling that from, from, uh, from, from other, the variance you're interested in. So yeah, and it come down to the school. So it came to, it was the school selection that, that, that got around it. I think increasingly we'll see less, there will be less of the challenges you're, uh, you're suggesting. As much as I'm, you know, I, I have reservations about the amount of technology that's used in a lesson in a classroom for various cognitive load reasons and so on, and, and, uh, and also, you know, students' difficulties with self-regulation and impulse control and all, that, so all those distractions. Um, I think the reality is they are increasingly becoming a presence in the classroom, so I suspect what you're talking about will be less of an issue, um, and even the um, you know, nationalised, and I think uh, there'll come a point where, even with, where disadvantaged schools will be supplied with these devices as a classroom presence as well, particularly because national literacy and numeracy testing is all moving online and now moving into adaptive, so an increasing um, need for government to provide schools with these things in classrooms. So I think it'll be less of it. But while we're in that, that, that awkward space where some schools are and some schools aren't, I think we just have to select the schools that are. So, to follow up on what uh, asked, so the schools and teachers' reactions, that, that's one thing, but uh, <coughs> the students also react, right? And what, what kind of, so that's a practical, uh, another practical uh, question, what kind of incentives did you use and what was the participation and the attrition rates? How did you manage to, to get the sample? And my second question would be, I mean, really striking the difference, uh, Lars, between your findings on the, just the relative percentages of the inverse between variants uh, and and uh, the ones you found in these two studies, would you, the two of you have any explanation for the, I mean, it's just substantial, right? It's two thirds of the team in the two studies you reported, only one third in the study uh, last day you did. That's amazing. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll, have a, um, I'll, I'll have a go at the last question. Um, and uh, the, um, I think Lars, with La, was yours more intensive longitudinal? Was how 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 many points was your level one? Um, between two and thirty-four, so depending on at, the at level at level one. Yeah, so around fifteen to seventeen observations per per student. Yeah. So so yeah. So so um, yeah. So we could get up to sixty, I guess. The other thing is, Lars, it might be the nature of the, the, the data, and so students were rating, I guess, their own motivation, uh, whereas in Lars's study, they were rating aspects of, of what they were doing and, and what they were doing in class. That might be another. I'm not sure if the fact it's four levels, um, and so we're, you know, but, but levels two and three didn't account for a great deal of variance in mind, so I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure there. But um, yeah, it's uh, that's a mystery. Yeah, I mean, you did have anxiety, uncertainty of control, and so on. That's pretty similar. I mean, the last is measures of positive, negative affect, and I mean, pretty similar. Yeah. And it's interesting that across studies one and two, um, across studies one and two, uh, there were similar various components in in, yeah. in ours. Yeah. Having said that, though. Uh, once we included prior motivation, the, the variance between students went, it was, then became about 50-50. Mm -hmm. So in, that, in, in the final two tables, where we included prior motivation engagement and all the covariates and prior achievement, it became 50-50 at mm -hmm. that point. Maybe that's a bit of an insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think your items are quite traitish still. Even though you're yeah. asking them repeatedly, and I think that might be something to do with it. Oh, yeah. like, I often oh, feel... Yeah, yeah, so it's, that's, and so I'm interested, I can't recall the specific items last asked, but they might have been far more located in the moment. Yeah, we really tried to ask, in this lesson, how did you feel? In yeah. this lesson, did you feel that, yeah. you, that you understood? Yeah. And I think yours are really more self yeah, yeah. So, so for example, oh, okay. we so we administered the short form of the MES 
as the short form. Whereas I, maybe if we drilled that, those items right down, you know, at this, at this moment in this activity, we might again get more level one, I suspect. Well. But, but, uh, but um, to the extent that that's relevant, uh, that's, that's a, a substantial um, research design point in the sense of really, the item wording can make a big difference in, in the substantive and applied conclusions. I still have two. One is Wayne, and the other is Chris. So <coughs> after that, please. So. And um, thank you. Uh, really interesting stuff. Thank you very much. Um, I'm particularly interested in the fact that everybody's today so far has been concentrated on self-report, and I'm curious to know what you think the impact of being self-report might be, um, and whether there's any um, mileage in attempting to use the technology to infer from the student's activity with technology in order to infer their, their motivation, etc. But also I was interested in, you know, you've been starting from two or three in a day up to weeks and months, and I'm curious about the opposite direction. Are you looking at considering motivated engagement through a learning session of, I don't know, 45 minutes or something? Um, so I'll take the, the second question first. What we're doing now is, um, and Lars is wearing one on his wrist right now, uh, we're about to give students uh, wrist, wristbands um, that, that collect um, a heart rate, EDA, stress levels, temperature, movement and so on. And so that just, that streams data. And so more of the biometric, because it's actually hard, you know, you can't get kids to jump on Survey Monkey every two or three minutes. So we're getting this stream of data and um, as well as collecting motivation engagement measures at a couple of points. And so that, that would be, I think, get it where, we're, where we're going now with the next phase for your, your second question. Um, with regards to the first uh, question, can you ref quickly refresh my memory? Well, you, you've kind of tackled it already. I, mean, I was talking about self-report. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, system. now, and so, yeah, so I think that's, so, so yeah, that, that's one way of getting around that. But one thing about this, and I didn't mention it, and, um, and, and it's not often recognised in multi-level modelling, and the, that is that at level one, level one is not only, well, whatever it is, intraday, intra-student, but it's also in a multi-level model, it's residual variance. Yep. So any variance that wasn't, wasn't able to be assigned at level four, three, and two, it'll all be, and so some people call it the trash can uh, of multi-level modelling. And so I think with self-reports, I suspect there'll be a fair bit in that level one that um, there's this messiness of selfness uh, that um, if we, and so for example, if we could get another report, we maybe actually have a new level one to disentangle self and teacher report. And, and so that becomes level two and then we've got a new trash can, but we can disentangle self from other. So, that's something we've also got to really get our heads around in terms of what level one variance <coughs> is. Come, yeah, just come back on very, very briefly, but um, a project I've been involved in, we've been using self-reports, observation in the classroom, plus what the student was doing on the technology, yeah. and trying to triangulate that to yeah. see is there some correlation as well. Yeah, and, and so the key word is, is, is having a design that can disentangle. Yeah. Is there one more somewhere? There's a Chris over there. And yeah, just about the, uh, the difference between the two studies and the results in them. Um, last study was in primary school, so if you're thinking about prior motivation, they're in the same class with the same teacher and the same classmates the whole day, whereas in secondary, if they're moving about going between lessons, that may also um, yeah. lead to a slightly different. Yeah, yeah. It'd be good actually to, for example, capture, so in Australia, year six is the final year in primary school, year seven is the first, so it'd be interesting to capture. So sort of close yeah. developmentally, but two top contexts. And again, build that in and, yeah. and partial out the variance. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.